no one in 1880 would have said that New York or Boston were the center of the artistic no, world. They uh, <laughs> you know, probably no one in 1930 would have said that. But yeah. after the war, in part because of this exodus of great talent from Europe, yeah. America has gained the center of, of yeah. gravity, particularly yeah. around. Uh, uh, abstract expressions. Of exactly. Writing. It's not like anything they've seen before. You know, abstraction, the idea of total abstraction, like, like these homage to the square series paintings by Albers, um, it's a hundred years old for us today, but they still shock us mm -hmm. sometimes when we're confronted with a monochromatic canvas or a painting of a square. It was really there was wild. A, there's this earlier dialogue in Europe where, these, mm -hmm. where abstraction is, is created, right? Yeah. And then, then the mm -hmm. dialogue continues here as the talent regroups and brings a new talent. And, and yeah. in some sense, all the artists are speaking to each other yeah. through their art and riffing on each other. Yeah, right? there's a sense of continuity within Europe. You can see how total abstraction emerges in figures like Vasily Kandinsky, but you have to remember in the United States, we didn't have that sense of continuity because these works weren't necessarily in our collections. So when total abstraction arrived, it arrived fully formed, and it was an incredible inspiration for artists who were living and working in New York where most of that work was, ex was available to them. So, Albers. Where did he come from? Where does this genius begin? Albers has a fascinating biography. He's a German-born artist, and he actually spent most of his early life as a teacher. He taught primary school before getting certification to teach art. And Albers was extremely fortunate because being a teacher, he was an essential kind of worker and was uh, exempt from military service. But still, at the conclusion of World War I, as Germany was experiencing this widespread transformation in almost every aspect of political and cultural society. Um, he was motivated to become a full-time artist and to, to leave teaching, at least temporarily, by going to school at the Bauhaus. This was 1920. It had just been opened in 1919, the prior year. So tell us about the Bauhaus. Where does this yeah. come from? Who are these artists who create this incredible school? So the Bauhaus was a revolutionary school of art design and architecture that was formed through the combination of the traditional Fine Arts Academy in Weimar, Germany, and the Applied or Decorative Arts School in Weimar, Germany. And so the most radical aspect of the Bauhaus as an educational institution was that it combined both training models into a single curriculum so that artists would learn crafts and trades and that craftsmen would learn art in, in terms of color theory as well as design theory. It's sort of a breakdown between the traditional barriers of something that's very sort of exactly. high end with something that's ordinary and trying to infuse yeah. artistic models to everything. Right? Yeah, and you've probably heard this phrase that sounds cliche, art into life, life into art, but that was something that really uh, started at least uh, in an early stage at the Bauhaus because they didn't understand why art only had to be in museums. as beautiful as these works are in museums, they wanted art to permeate every aspect of, the, of life, including the built environment, mm -hmm. like cities, um, in, including things as small as teacups um, and placemats. So oh. at, at 32, it's this kind of incredible risk that he's taking. He wants to be an artist, and he wants also to participate in this great educational experiment that is the Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. Um, because of his educational background. But one of the great things is that after uh, graduating, he's hired as one of the first students to become a teacher. So he's hired as a teacher when the school moves from Weimar, its original home, to Dessau. And how many years was Albers at, at the Bauhaus? He, he had the longest tenure of any artist at the Bauhaus student or faculty. He joined as a student in 1920 and was there until it was closed by the Nazis in 1933, so 13 years. So clearly it's a, a future of a, a free art was not there in 1933. No, it wasn't. And importantly, his wife, Ani Albers, who was in her own right a fabulous textile artist and weaver, a student of weaving at the Bauhaus, which is how they met. Um, she was um, from the Ulstein family, which had converted from Judaism to Christianity in the 1880s, but under the Nuremberg laws was still considered sure. Jewish. And so there was no way specifically for Ani to stay in the country um, as Hitler took power. So. What drew them to the U.S. as opposed to other ports of, as opposed to Amsterdam or, yeah. or London? Yes. Job offer. So within the context of the 30s, it was really impossible for Germans to immigrate into another country legally without a job offer. 
So Eddie Warburg and Philip Johnson, uh, a wonderful American architect, mm -hmm. um, kind of finagled this job opportunity for Albers to teach at Black Mountain College. So Johnson had been traveling throughout Europe in the 20s, I yes, guess. Yes, exactly, and, and had met and Albers right. and was right, admired his work greatly. And became um, the apostle of modernism in, in New York. Yes, of course, especially through his association with the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So he's a, a wonderful figure in this history. Um, and without his advocacy, it's unclear whether Albers would have received that essential job offer that enabled him and Annie to leave. And I should say Annie also taught at Black Mountain, so they mm -hmm. both had teaching positions there. Where exactly is Black Mountain College? North Carolina. It's North Carolina. Yeah, so, it's so in rural he's, North he's Carolina. He's moving from this very urban yeah. culture in Dessau and Weimar and, yeah. and earlier. Uh, yeah. uh, he was moving to rural North Carolina to, to yeah. teach art. How does his art change with coming to America? It, uh... Well, so he's not doing any more glassworks, or uh -huh. he is infrequently. I mean, at the Bauhaus, he's designing furniture, he's creating these glass pieces, he's also painting and doing prints. It's really once he comes to Black Mountain College, and realistically, he has less time to do his mm -hmm. own art than he did earlier, um, he turns really more towards paintings and prints. Um, and using the same vocabulary of geometric abstraction that you see in his Bauhaus works. Um, and he becomes famous for reworking the same motifs over and over and over again, which is one of the defining characteristics of the homage to the square series. Right. So when is the first homage to the square painted? When, when does this... Uh... So 1950, actually, after, after Albers has left Black Mountain College. So um, he's at Black Mountain College from 1933 until 1950. Mm -hmm. And in 1950, he's offered a position at Yale University. Mm -hmm. And in the same year he moves to Yale, he starts this series of Homage to the Square series, mm -hmm. which ultimately would include over a thousand works, a thousand paintings, not including prints using the same motif. Um, and he would continue to make them from 1950 until his death in 1976. So the squares, and they start in 1950, and mm -hmm. there, are, there are thousands of them. So what do you see when you look at these, these marvelous paintings? When you look at these, you see form in, in the shape of the square, and you see color. And that is exactly what Albers intended for you to see. There's no necessary, there's no hidden significance. It isn't representative of anything in, in the real world. You know, he's starting with the square format of, of the canvas, which in this case is a, is a board, um, and he's repeating it in diminishing sizes that are mathematically proportionate, so the intervals between the nested squares are one to one at the bottom, two to two at the side, and three to three on the top. Hmm. Um, and those proportions stay consistent across the series. Mm -hmm. um, homage to the square because he always uses the square because um, it's a consistent form that you can shrink, that you can enlarge, um, and that speaks to the status of this painting as a painting, by which I mean the echoing of the shape of the canvas um, reminds us that we're looking at a representation of a representation, mm -hmm. that art is um, about vision and it's mm -hmm. about the visible and, and making the visible, kind of enacting the visible.